What has it been like for you the past two months being back here at the Montana State Prison? Uh, it's it's been a a very extreme emotional roller coaster to, to say the least. I mean, uh, first of all, just to be back here after spending thirty years here and and, and it's it's been a tremendous tremendous shock. I still wake up some mornings and just cannot believe I'm back in prison after being granted a new trial based on new evidence. An eyewitness to the crime that came forward, and yet here I'm back in Montana State Prison, fighting for my life once again, and it just it just totally blanks out my mind and. You know, I, I just can't seem to grasp it sometimes. Uh, still, still two, two months later, truly shocked and devastated. Uh, what's, get it, what's keeping you positive? Well, I still, first and foremost, I still believe in my God. And I still believe in the power of spirituality that gave me my first opportunity of freedom. But second of all, I can't even begin to tell you how much support I have out there. Uh, people that I've never met, people who don't know me, thousands and thousands of people all across the United States, across the state of Montana. I don't know if you're aware of this, but I have over 6,000 signatures on a petition right now. Uh, which apparently doesn't mean anything to the state authorities, but to me, I can't even, I mean, that's unreal. Over 6,000 signatures of people who feel truly outraged over the Montana Supreme Court decision to reverse this new trial, rather than allow the new trial to take place. Uh, I, get, I, I get letters every day from people all across this state. I, I, got a set, I got a collection of letters this morning in the mail uh, from a lady out of Absorkey who wrote every, th every official in the state of Montana talking about how truly outraged she is at the system in Montana. Right, wrong, or indifferent, her position is, is that I've already done 30 years for something that happened when I was 17 years old. At one point in time, her position is, at what point in time does the state of Montana say enough is enough? When we're talking something that happened as a juvenile. Uh, but I get letters like that all the time. People out there are truly and seriously angered over this situation. Um, what's the daily routine like here? for you? Is it back to uh, what it was before when you were here the 30 <laughs> years prior? Maybe a little bit too much so, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I got, I, like most people, I get up in the morning, usually about 6, 6.30 in the morning I will get up. I'll get ready for work. I go to work about quarter to eight in the morning. Um, I'll go to work. I'll, I do maintenance again. So I'm, in fact, I'm right back with my old boss in the old position of doing building maintenance as a tech. I've already, I've already been on a couple of roofs already this year. Uh, I get off work usually about 2, 2.30, depending on what jobs we have going on. If we're on a roof, I, they're, you know, it's about 4 o'clock when we get off the roofs. Uh, come home, shower up, go to the gym, come home from gym, it's time for supper. You know, it's a, you build your life, you, you know. Uh, you asked me a little while ago what keeps me positive. And I don't know about positive, negative, or otherwise. It really doesn't even matter. No matter where you're at in your life, it's still your life. You still have the choice and the power to make something of your life to try and do something with it 
or just let life pass you by. Uh, and I've always tried my very best to realize that I was given today to live. So I have to do something with this day. Now that doesn't mean I have to be happy with it. It doesn't mean I have to be happy with my circumstances. But if I get the opportunity, I need to make something out of this day. Uh, and one of the things I, my mom come to see me a couple of weeks ago, and just her for the first time, it was just me and my mom. And we've talked about the fact that we're both still so shocked and devastated we haven't even had a chance to cry. But as we were sharing that and talking about how scared we are and how saddened we are and concerned about my current situation, I told my mom that one of my greatest goals when I was here for the first 30 years was I didn't want to leave prison the same man that I came into prison. And I kind of feel that way even stronger now. I went out there and for 18 months I showed myself and proved to myself that a lot of my thoughts and my ideas about my business and how to make money and how to be successful will work. Well, I don't know how long I'm going to be back at Montana State Prison, but by the grace of God, I'm hoping it's not long. But while I'm here, there's some things I want to improve on. So that when I get my next chance to go out there, I'm going to be older. I'm going to be a little bit sore, a little bit stiffer. But I've got to go back out there and once again be successful. And I've even got less time now to work on my retirement. So I have to take that information. I have to do better at what I did the first time. Uh, How has your, you've talked about your faith quite a bit. How has your faith um, helped you through, through this? And are you able to um, still be able to be a messenger um, for the Lord? Because I know that's been important for you. Well, if I'm a messenger for the Lord, that's up to Him. To me, it's just simply about, you know, just before I came up here, I spent some time in reading my Bible and praying, and it had nothing to do about this moment in time. Uh, you know, asking God to guide me, asking Him to give me the thoughts and the wisdom and the, and the ideas that I need to be able to carry on through this day. You know, asking the Lord to show me how to fight this situation because the state of Montana is adamantly set on keeping me here for the rest of my life. That's not going to be easy to overcome. It was hard enough to overcome the first time. It took me 30 years to overcome that the first time. And now basically I'm at a point where I've even had an eyewitness come forward. In fact, it was 24 witnesses that came forward. 24 witnesses from across the state of Montana that came forward, including an eyewitness. And basically the state of Montana and the courts in the state of Montana have said that none of that even matters. You're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. Well, if none of that matters, I honestly don't know how to overcome this again. Uh, so I need God's guidance. And you, you asked how does my faith and you know keep me going I kind of look at it like John chapter 6 verse 68 where the disciples of Jesus were all fleeing and all the people were fleeing Jesus and he turned to Peter and he says are you gonna go too?" and Peter turned to him and says without you where would I go well, if I'm miserable and confused and angry at my situation right now with God and with God's help, I really don't want to know what it, I would be like if I didn't have His help. I'd rather have that chance to pray. There's a lot of times walking these sidewalks in here or sitting in the gym that it, just in my head, it's just praying to God and talking to God and whether I'm talking to myself, whether I'm talking to space or He really exists, which I really believe He exists. I've seen too many answers to prayer, but it gets me through that moment of time. It helps me stabilize my emotions for that moment. 
And once I get through that moment, I can get to the next one. I don't know where the answer to this situation is going to end up at. So I have to get through this moment and this day. And that's where praying to God helps. I'd rather have him, and I'd rather have him to talk to than not to have anybody. You say you don't know where this is going to end up. Um, I don't know when it's going to end. It's going to end up with me back on the street. I just hope it happens before my mom passes away. So you, you're holding fast to the belief that some, at some point you will be set free again? Uh, yeah, absolutely. The state of Montana and the courts of the state of Montana don't want to see it that way, but uh, I still have quite an appeal process. And one of the things that me and my lawyers keep talking about is the fact that my first 30 years was trying to overcome the conviction. It's different now. I may be back in prison, but I was granted a new trial. And it is that judicial decision by Judge Phillips that is the basis of my new appeal. I'm not challenging the conviction anymore. The conviction was already overturned by Judge Phillips. Now I'm going to the courts and claiming what is rightfully mine, what was rightfully granted by Judge Phillips, which is the new trial. Uh, there are some very strong federal cases and that support Judge Phillips' ruling. So when we get into the federal courts, uh, those federal cases will have precedent over state law. More important, uh, we've had three more witnesses come forward. We actually had developed some DNA from the crime, crime scene prior to me being sent back to prison because we were in preparation for a new trial. We now have DNA from the crime scene that the FBI has a report saying is unequivocally attached to this crime scene. Uh, and it's not mine, and it's not the victim's. You know, And at some point in time, these other new witnesses, this other new information that's coming forward, we're going to get to utilize all that. Even if we have to go all the way back to the state district court and file a whole new post-conviction petition on new evidence. We will do that. I want to um, read to you a little something um, from the Montana Supreme Court decision and kind of just get your, get your response to some of the things that, that the justice has said, because I think it's, it's interesting. Um, so in Rice's decision, he says, that the new evidence is not reliable and that Beach's innocence claims must fail. What, what's your response to that? Coming from a Montana Supreme Court justice, that's probably one of the saddest statements that you could ever send to an eyewitness who withheld their information for over 30 years and emotionally broke down in testimony to where she had to be calmed by the courts. And then you turn around and tell her that she is of no value. Uh, and it's not just the eyewitness testimony that he's talking about. That it, it saddens me. It truly saddens me. And that's why the citizens of the state of Montana are so outraged. Take a look at Carl Forstar, who came forward at the Montana clemency hearing in 2007. After he returned to Poplar, Montana from the testifying at the clemency hearing, he was beaten and attacked by the Atkinson family. And now you're going to tell him that his testimony is of no value. He was beaten because of his testimony to the point that he wouldn't even appear at the Lewistown hearing. 
They had to send a court order, have him arrested, and brought from Wolf Point to Lewistown to testify. And the first thing he tells the judge is that he's in fear of his life. And he does not want to testify. And then our Montana Supreme Court is going to tell him if he's no value? You answer that, Judge Rice. You go tell that witness that when he went through that beating, that that was of no value. Judy Greyhawk, the sister-in-law of Maude Greyhawk, came to the clemency hearing in 2007 and testified against her sister-in-law under the threat by her husband that at he, if she testified, he was going to end their 34-year marriage. He was going to divorce her and leave her and the four kids if she testified. Now, first and foremost, I don't know of too many Native American marriages that have lasted for 34 years. And then she put that in marriage on the line to testify, and now a Supreme Court justice is going to say that that is of no value? Not only that, when she got back to Poplar, Montana, she was threatened and harassed by her in-laws to the point that now she really doesn't even want to talk to my legal team, let alone testify again. And you're going to say, that's of no value, Jim Rice? Steffi Eagleboy has had her life threatened on four different occasions since testifying before the Judge Phillips. She has had her life threatened. People have called her home and actually came and knocked on her door and threatened her life. And you're going to say that that testimony is of no value. It doesn't matter. We have somebody in prison, and that's enough. You really need to think about why you're sitting on the Supreme Court when you say that witnesses of that caliber are of no value. He also said Beach has never provided a coherent and consistent explanation as to why he, a supposedly innocent man, confessed to brutally murdering these. Well, I don't know how much more consistent you can be other than to say that the confession is false and that it was coerced, and I've said that from the day one. I've never changed from that position. That was our statement at our original trial. That's been my statement ever since. Uh, I don't think that unless I was testifying on behalf of the Attorney General's office, obviously my testimony doesn't matter no matter what I say. In three different hearings, I've presented 34 different witnesses and had every single one of my witnesses, every single one of the 34 witnesses, deemed uncredible. Every one of 34 citizens in the state of Montana were deemed incredible by the courts and parole board. And yet, the Montana Supreme Court, this same justice, Judge Rice, in that same ruling, relied upon the testimony of Errol Wilson. Errol Wilson testified at my trial about facts that he didn't document. There's not a single police report supporting what he testified to. He made no arrest supporting what he testified to. He did. He issued no search warrants to support what he testified to. He didn't talk to his superiors about what he testified to. There's no documentation anywhere in this entire case as to what this police officer testified to, and yet he's credible. I had an eyewitness testify to something that she saw and heard and to this day, 34 years later, has nightmares about. And that's not credible. In the dissent that was um, written by Brian Morris, Justin, Justice Brian Morris, you know, he obviously dis disagrees with the decision of the court. He says this ruling marks what likely will be the final chapter in the saga of Barry Beach. And then he goes on to say, We oversee a criminal justice system that seeks to resolve a defendant's guilt through processes created and administered by humans. Humans by nature are fallible, and the processes that humans create share this same fallibility. Do you have any faith 
in this system? Do you have any faith in this justice system? I still believe that the United States of America has one of the best criminal justice systems in the world outside of that human fallibility. The problem with our justice system is that when we make a mistake as justices, we don't want to admit that mistake. There have been hundreds of exonerees in the United States of America in the last 15 years since the advent of DNA. One of the cases that I think of all the time here in the state of Montana, our Chief Justice of the Montana Supreme Court, Mike McGrath, was the Attorney General at the time when Jimmy Ray Bromgard, through DNA, was exonerated. And even after DNA exonerated Jimmy Ray Bromgard, I remember Mike McGrath going on TV and making the statement <coughs> that it is his belief that Jimmy Ray Bromgard is fully guilty of the crime. Talk about human infallibility or fallibility. The saddest thing we can do as human beings is to take one mistake and compound it by not admitting to that mistake. And especially when we teach our kids from the time that they're able to walk that if you do something wrong, you just say you do something wrong. You admit to it. You just tell me the truth and we'll fix it. It's absolutely amazing that that moral and spiritual standard exists in our life to every aspect except for justice. Why doesn't it apply to our justice system? One of the things that the citizens in the state of Montana right now cannot comprehend and what ha makes them so angry about this situation, not just the justice issues, not just the fact that not a single shred of physical evidence from the crime scene matches me, but I was 17 years old. 30 years later, the state of Montana once again is trying to put me in prison for the rest of my life. And that does not represent the thoughts and the concepts or the morality of the citizens of our state. That is not what they expect from our judicial system. So do you still have faith in it? Is there, is there a shred of hope that you have in it? Well, I have to have faith in it because I'm still fighting in it. Uh, the only way I'm going to return to my family is through that justice system. Uh, to kind of answer your question in a little bit different concept, part of the reason that Judge Morris felt that this is probably the end of the saga, when the Montana Supreme Court wrote their ruling, I had been time barred in federal courts and therefore there was a belief even amongst my own legal team that I did not have an opportunity to appeal this decision. When I was asked to turn myself in, my legal team had already told me that I very well could be turning myself in for the rest of my life. Because we did not see an opportunity to appeal this decision by the Supreme Court. Having faith in God usually changes things. When I was sitting on reception, May 28th, 2013, I had already been back at Montana State Prison for two weeks, sitting on reception when the United States Supreme Court issued a ruling stating that there is no time bar in federal courts on factual innocence claims, which opened the gateway for me to file a federal appeal. That was a federal appeal that the Supreme Court justices didn't think I was going to have when they wrote their order. We're going to federal court. Uh, so what, what is your message to the people of Montana? Because people are watching your case. People are watching you. They know who you are. They know your, <laughs> they know your story. Um, <coughs> what, what's your message to them? Thank you. I pray for you as hard as you pray for me. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of strange to feel 
the way I feel about the people in the state and nationwide, I mean, and worldwide. I've heard from the Philippines, I've heard from Finland, I've heard from England, Nova Scotia, uh, Australia, Hawaii, I mean, people all around the world. But I need you to stand up and make the system represent you properly, but at the same time, I'm not going to give up. I've, come, I've come to learn a long time ago that this case is not about Barry Beach. This case is not about just my freedom. This isn't just about me going back to my mother. People all across this country have a certain expectation of our judicial system. If a person is truly and honestly guilty of the crime that puts them in prison, they want them punished. I understand that. And I understand it because I meet guys every day. Uh, but when the system has made a mistake, they want the system to admit it's made a mistake. In my particular case right now, one of the greatest outcries of the citizens of the state of Montana is knowing that I was 17 years old. Knowing that there is so much question and so much doubt about this case and that has arisen about this case, find a way to resolve it. Whether that's through ordering the parole board to commute my sentence, whether that's ordering the parole board to take the no parole off my sentence and put me out on parole for the rest of my life. The citizens want something done by the system. Uh, you asked me if I have faith in the system. Whether I have faith in the system or not being its victim for all these years, I think the system needs to worry and ask the question of themselves, do the people who signed that petition, do those 6,000 plus citizens of the state of Montana who signed that petition, do they have faith in the system? And is the system going to honor that faith or are they going to ignore these people and destroy what little bit of faith they may have left? Over 6 thousand signatures and I make a joke to guys in here uh, at the same time I put my petition online through change.org Brian Schweitzer put a petition online on through change.org Brian Schweitzer got 4,300 signatures mm -hmm. right now I've got 6,200 and some odd signatures uh, do they have faith in the system and how's the system going to answer those people And that's a joke, Brian. I'm just kidding you. <laughs> so, and you've you've had your mom's been up to visit you. You've yeah. seen her, and you've have you had other visitors to come and see you and encourage yeah, I've, you. Yeah, I've actually had three or four visits since being back. People who. Uh, uh, People who know me out there, who got to know me out there, have been very concerned about me. Uh, How's your mental health right now? I'm a survivor. I've always been a survivor, and I'm, I'm not stupid enough to sit here and say that I'm not shaken. I'm not stupid enough to sit here and not say that I'm really struggling with certain things. Uh, they're trying to take the rest of my life. I had to fight for 30 years to get a judge to do what was right to begin with. And now I'm back. They have me back in prison. They have me back doing the rest of my life in prison. And if I thought that I was innocent before and if I thought the situation was wrong to begin with, I can honestly sit here and tell you that right now it's twice as wrong. It's wrong in every way, shape, and capacity you could possibly look at. Uh, 
you read from Justice Rice's opinion. One of the things that Justice Rice's opinion talks about is the evidence that the state has against me. That same evidence would have been able to be presented at the new trial. Any and all evidence that the state has against me would have been presented at the new trial. And there are so, so, so many people out there who want to know from the state of Montana, why didn't you let the trial happen? If I'm so guilty, I would have been found guilty again. And then I would have been sitting back in Montana State Prison with no argument. Then I would have been sitting in Montana State Prison without an opportunity to make a claim of innocence. If the state of Montana's evidence against me is that strong, then let it come forth. And that doesn't scare you? Not one bit. Not at all. Let's go. My legal team, Centurion Ministries of Princeton, New Jersey, has interviewed over 238 citizens of Poplar, Montana who were out and about in Poplar, Montana on the night that Kim Neese was killed. Out of 238 people who were out and about town that night, including all my classmates, including all of my friends, including all of my family, including everybody else who knew me in that community, out of 238 people, not one single person saw me that night. They didn't see me at any of the parties. They didn't see me cruising any of the streets. They didn't see me anywhere in Poplar, Montana, which is only a community of about 2,300 people at that time. There's only one drag in Poplar, Montana. Nobody saw me. None of the physical evidence matches me. And I'll remind you, in case people have forgot, I will remind you, there were 32 fingerprints on that pickup several of which are in the victim's blood. There were actually 10 palm prints on that pickup. Two of them are unidentified. One of those two is in the victim's blood. There are seven footprints where they drug her body from her pickup down to the river. Seven footprints. There were clumps of hair. There were seven clumps of hair, piles and clumps of hair found around the, on the ground around that pickup. Bloody matted clumps of hair. Seven of them. Some of that hair is not the victim's. Out of all that physical evidence from the crime scene, none of it is mine. Not one single piece of evidence, not one hair matches Berry Beach. This isn't a crime scene that didn't have evidence at it. This isn't a crime scene. This is a crime scene that I've actually had FBI agents currently write to me and say, man, I wished I had that kind of evidence. With that kind of evidence, I could solve any crime. Well, none of that evidence matches me. The only thing that put me in prison is a false coerced confession. And as you're well aware of, being from the media, we now have the personnel file from the Louisiana detective where he has a history. He has a history. We have found 10 confessions that this detective took on major cases where all 10 of those confessions were proven false by DNA. We found major cases where this detective, he had a history where his own superiors, including Alfred Calhoun, who was involved in this interrogation, have actually suspended him for misconduct, for police misconduct, which includes taking evidence from the evidence room, which includes not make, writing reports, which includes not documenting confessions. Do I fear a new trial? Absolutely not. 